Thanks for tuning in and welcome everybody in our audience today. I'm Rick Ray. I am a huge contributor to Adobe Stock and today we're going to spend a little bit of time learning how any of you can travel the world and become a significant contributor to Adobe Stock footage. If I was going to describe myself, I would just tell you I'm a gorilla stock shooter. I also shoot stock of gorillas. But I travel the world lightweight, low key. I want to show you something. Everything you're going to see today is created out of this bag and one tripod. And I'm going to teach you how to do all of that for under $1,500 per piece of equipment. So I hope you're interested and we're going to go on a little journey. What I want to show you first is some of my best selling work on Adobe Stock. This is the result of about the last 10 years of travel. So um, let me give you a little demo here and you can kind of feel out what I do and decide if it's something you might like to do yourself.
So I got to say, that's a lot of passport stamps, guys. <laughs> Thank you. This is uh, really a passion of mine. And I guess the ultimate question is, why would you want to get involved? Why would you want to shoot stock footage for Adobe and other agencies that are out there? Well, I think the most exciting part of this is that here's the raw footage that you create. And I've just picked three of my shots. And here's where they turn up. You never know where you're going to see what you contribute to Adobe Stock. You upload your clips, and suddenly you find them just browsing on TV the next night. It's really quite astonishing. And even more exciting is the fact that 90% of what you create, you never see. It'll be used in corporate presentations. It'll be used in educational films. It'll be used in small um, applications that basically uh, you won't know about. But the good news is you'll get paid anyway. And I've done something very cynical here, and I hope you'll bear with me. Whenever I get an email from Adobe Stock, and they send emails whenever they make a sale for you, I've attached a little sound effect that goes off on my phone. It sounds like this. I know that's obnoxious, but I got to hear it one more time. And honestly, even if that goes off in the middle of the night and it wakes me up, I still feel really good. Well, you can be doing this too, and I just want to share with you how I got started, and I'm sure it's identical to how all of you got started. I got started by meeting Jack Palance. Okay, probably most of you are too young to know who Jack Palance was, but he was a great B-movie actor, a Western hero in Western movies, and later he played Curly in City Slickers, if you remember that. Anyway, I graduated from the University of California in Santa Barbara with a film degree. I headed down into Los Angeles, assured that this expensive degree would get me a job as the next Hollywood feature film director, right? And you know what happened. I got a job being the chauffeur for Jack Palance on Ripley's Believe It or Not television show. That's not a bad gig, but it wasn't quite what I was expecting. Now, Jack was a rough old character. He would sit in the back seat of the limo during the one-hour drive from the desert, and he would say things like, what's your name, kid? And I'd say, uh, my name's Rick Ray. I graduated from film school. He'd say, yeah, film school is worthless, kid. I'd say, well, He'd say, who did you study? I'd say, Buster Keaton, Charlie Chaplin, all the biggies. And he'd say, yeah, worthless, kid. Don't be the next Buster Keaton. Don't be the next Charlie Chaplin. Be the first Rick Ray. Get out there, buy a backpack, buy a notebook, buy a camera. See the world, because being a copy of a copy of a copy in Hollywood, it's worthless, kid. And I've cut out most of the four-letter words, if not all of them, for our family audience and our online viewers. But that was Jack. And two years later, I sold almost everything I owned. I quit Ripley's, believe it or not. I headed out onto the road. I lived in a Buddhist monastery in Thailand. I worked on a sheep station in New Zealand. I played ragtime piano in an Australian bar for cash. And I played a little semi-pro basketball in New Zealand. That's to tell you this was a long time ago. Our gear in those days was this, a 16-millimeter wind-up camera, a Bolex. Heavy, heavy gear, 16-millimeter film. And let me tell you, whenever you press the button on that camera, it cost you $25 a second. When you took into consideration processing and the cost of film stock and getting all of that to video and getting it to the client, it was very expensive. And it taught me to be extremely efficient even today when we can run a camera for hours I only press that button when I think the moment has really come and, and come to fruition. Later in my life, well down the road, I met and befriended His Holiness the Dalai Lama of Tibet. I had the privilege of making, living in his monastery, interviewing him and making what some say is a definitive movie about his life. It's the one he recommends called Ten Questions for the Dalai Lama. I also went on to make a whole lot of other travel videos and DVDs. Some of them documentary, many of them just involving culture and wildlife and nature. And I'm here to tell you today that all the money that I made on all of these, unless you're Michael Moore or Ken Burns, documentaries don't pay that much money. But when I've broken down all the individual shots in these movies and made them into stock footage, 
I've made more money in, a, in two weeks of stock footage than I have made pretty much per year from all of these titles. Today, I have about 20,000 contemporary 1080 and 4K clips. Uh, humbly speaking, they've generated about a half a million dollars for me in the last uh, five years. Uh, I've started up a couple of downloadable royalty-free libraries. One is called DV Archive. This is my own kind of lemonade stand compared to some of the other big ones like Adobe Stock, but it helps having a nice library for people to look at and get to know. And then I also collect old archival footage and public domain footage, and I've made that available on a second website I founded called retrofootage.org. So here's the ultimate question. We're at NAB, what gear should I buy? I am not here to televangelize about which gear you should use. Everybody has their favorite equipment that they're comfortable with, that they love to use. I'm simply going to tell you, travel light. Be efficient and be low key. So here's a mistake. Mistake number one. Look really important. If you're going to a foreign country, or even in this country, and you begin flashing all of your fancy gear around, you're going to invite a lot of questions. A lot of people are going to ask you what you're doing, and you may even invite the police and other authorities. I don't know what this guy was doing, but um, I would like to see the 5D film he made out of that. No, no, my way of working is very low key. Everything should fit in a bag. One bag, over your shoulder, plus the tripod. So I love this little Sony camera. It's my workhorse. I have two of them on every shoot. It's the uh, FDR AX100. It shoots beautiful 4K, has a one-inch chip, 18 to 1 zoom, and Zeiss lenses. Yes, you could do better right here on the show floor. That's obvious. But you could also spend a lot of time answering questions that I don't have to answer. Many people also prefer to use uh, a still camera like this. This is what's recommended by other stock shooters. I don't use this camera, but I always travel with my uh, drone, my Mavic Pro. The reason I love the Mavic is because it folds down. It doesn't have that big profile that the Phantom 4 and other drones do have, although I love those drones. The problem is, of course, they, they call the attention of customs authorities. This looks like a shaving kit, doesn't it? I have my little DJI Osmo. This takes the place of those big, heavy glide cams and steady cam units. Easily fits into that same bag I just showed you. And here's the one area where you don't skimp if you're creating stock footage. Get a good tripod. Okay, this is vital. I'm not saying the Sackler is the right one, but take a small, light, low-key tripod that still has a great ball head, gives you great steadiness, because your shots will be rejected if they're jiggly and handheld and look amateurish at Adobe Stock. I just discovered to, a couple of days ago these great sliders from Edelkron. I think they're wonderful. You can hook those up to your tripod and create beautiful gliding motion, and that clients love that. They'll pay extra for that kind of production value, and they'll never know that you were doing it on a little chargeable uh, unit like that. It all fits into that solar bag, which even when it's sitting over there and I'm uh, filming, it's charging my gear. Also important, on your phone, bring along Easy Release or some other uh, model release program. This is uh, an app that you can download. Whenever you meet people, you need to get releases. Adobe Stock will not take content that is prominent in the frame that does not have a release attached to it. And at this time, Adobe Stock is also not taking editorial content. So you must get releases for anyone that you're filming that looks prominent. And this is a nice little device to do it. When I go overseas and I prepare for my shoot, the first thing I do, I mean, I hate to promote Adobe so much, but I, after all, I am up here. I go to Adobe Stock and I look and see what already is selling. I sort by best selling or most viewed um, or popularity. And that helps me know what's already out there and what my competition looks like. Of course, I go to Google Images. I sort through Google Images endlessly. And like a detective, I look for shots that I want to emulate when I go to that country. And I'll find out at all costs where those, sh where those shots were taken and try to get there and uh, try to get them in similar light and 
Um, imitation's the sincerest form of flattery. I also use Instagram and Pinterest, and I use a very uh, odd website called Camera Obscura, which, I mean Atlas Obscura, which I love, which um, is a couple of guys that have located unusual, obscure, and weird destinations. They're not always photogenic, but they're always fascinating. And uh, I add them to the list, and then finally I make a Google map. And this Google map becomes my itinerary. It's not one resort to another. I never want to see you sitting around a swimming pool on a good sunny day. You're not a stock shooter if you're doing that. You're following along, following the dots, and seeing where life leads you with your camera. And the magic generally happens in between those dots. What do I shoot? Well, this is also strictly personal, but one thing that's very popular today is breaking news. What's happening in the world? What's going on right now? Global warming is on our minds. It's been on our minds for 10 years. Images surrounding global warming are bestsellers. The border, immigration, it's been talked about all the time recently. Anticipate these trends. See if you can get out there and get shots in anticipation of them. This is my neighborhood in Ventura, California. 750 houses burned in my neighborhood just a few months ago. My house did not burn, but this is a shot from my house of my neighbor's houses burning. When the fire came and all the houses began burning around me, I had a garden hose in one hand, and I had that 4K Sony camera in the other hand. Because you know, if my house is going to burn down, I needed a little bit of income to rebuild it, so I needed to hear... If you have weather in your neighborhood, if you have something going on, go out and film it. It's hard to license this stuff from the Weather Channel and CNN and so on. Also, get off the beaten track. There's tons of footage of London and Paris and Tokyo, but think about going to places that are unusual, unique. You won't have as much competition in sales if you do this, uh, and you'll have a lot of fun. So see what you can find and uh, what might be of interest. And finally, I think the most important advice is follow your passion. Know what you think is your strength. Maybe it's wildlife shooting. Maybe it's working with people. Maybe it's uh, time lapse, if you love that. Or maybe it's uh, doing aerials. Whatever it is, or if you can do all of them, you'll be a great Renaissance man, and you'll get it all uh, in your pocket. So to, to wrap it up a little bit, how do you become a good travel shooter? Love travel. I mean, it's obvious. That sounds... Um, redundant, but you really have to be a good traveler if you do what I do. I generally take no more than one person and hire one person in the country as a fixer to get me around. So I'm working alone. If you bring a crew, you're probably going to become something under yourself um, and uh, not experience the people as closely as you might. And I love to share what I'm filming with the people that participate and make it all possible. Even more so, keep your radar on you can, you know, you're going to New Jersey and you think, nobody wants shots of New Jersey. Uh, people want shots of New Jersey. This is a scavenger hunt. The imagery that you're going to be collecting can fit anybody's production. You have no idea what they're doing or what they're thinking. They may very well want shots of New Jersey. So you're always working, you're always thinking, and you're always pursuing images every day. Along the way, be willing to change your plan if necessary. Sometimes the best things happen when you least expect them, so get out there and see what happens. And be willing to take risks. Don't be scared. People are good everywhere in the world. This is the hardest bit of advice. We all want to have a producer that gives us money to go somewhere. We want to have someone paying us. That's the first way to lose control of your product and to lose the autonomy that you need to market what you shoot in Adobe stock. Because now you need permissions from everyone else. So, Travel first and pay later. The money trickles in, but it will come, um, and you have to be willing to take that risk in advance. The most important question. If you are arrested, you never heard this lecture, and I do not know you. However, it will happen. Things will happen. Questions will be asked. To get this shot in northern Greece in a beautiful place called Meteora, one day later, I crossed the border 
into the lovely country of Macedonia, where corrupt bo、uh, border guards robbed me of all my gear. They simply stopped every car at the border of Macedonia on that day, in a remote place, and took whatever stuff they wanted. But I got into the drone while I was being held in captivity, and I got the card out. I didn't swallow it, but I got the card, and that resulted in that shot. I was put on trial. And find five hundred dollars and spend three days in a Macedonian holding facility for taking a few shots. This is a shot in northern Kenya. It's a beautiful shot. It sells a lot. However, to get it, I took a, a three-day trip there. A few days after I shot, tourist van was held up. The people were arrested,、uh, and shots were fired. This is one of the funnier shots. Not a great shot, but I took it in a market in Ethiopia. I didn't realize I was being watched, but the police came and、uh, let's put it this way: they put me into detention for a day. Once a price was negotiated, the Ethiopian police decided that they could afford to be my reenactment actors the next day. Same police force, same guys, new price, and yes, they signed releases. Now you can upload your footage directly in a media encoder, through it,、uh, and upload it to Adobe Stock. As I've preached to all of you just now, get out there and shoot. So in the days that I haven't been lecturing here at NAB, I've been out shooting. This is just down the road here in Vegas. It's a nice shot. It's holding. It's、uh, freezing up a little bit, but I just want to show you that. And I'm doing PowerPoint, so I'm not going to actually go on and show you how to do this. But when you go into Media Encoder, you are able to right up here export your content to Adobe Stock. Make sure you have an account on Adobe Stock. You know your password. All you have to do is check the box right there into your account. It will be uploaded to Adobe Stock, and of course, then it goes through curation. It will be automatically keyworded, and you can add specific keywords as well. But just be aware. That it's not going online tomorrow. It's going to take a little time, and it's going to need to be reviewed and made sure that it fits in with Adobe's guidelines. But great way to then build up your portfolio in Adobe Stock. This is mine, and、um, it just grows by the day. And、um, that sound is really nice to hear. We're not, well, maybe one more time, right? Anyway, if you want to hear more about my travels and my methods. And the excitement of doing this job, you can come over and see me. I'm glad to answer your questions. You can also buy me a beer if you want to hear about all the places I've been arrested or held for making movies.、Um, but just because I've played that sound effect over and over, does not mean I'm paying for the beer. Thank you all for coming. It's been fun to、uh, share all of this with you, and I'll see you next time.